Father in heaven, uh, it is our prayer as we just sung that all the earth uh, would fear you, Lord, um, that you would uh, more and more manifest uh, your gracious presence in this world through drawing more and more sinners unto yourself, Lord. And we pray that in this lecture, uh, you would stir us up, Lord, to be instruments in your hand for going out into the field. For as you've told us, it is white for harvest. Lord, bless this time together, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, so we saw in the last lecture, I've got only one question for you uh, this time, and this, this, uh, this lecture will be more of a monologue, but who can give us what the gospel is? What is one sentence sum of the gospel? The good news. The good news. Amen. Good news of what? Good six o'clock news? The good news of God's salvation of sinners through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Together they are one great answer. Yes, and we saw that it was easy as right. One, two, three, one God, two Adams, and three responses. Okay, so we've seen what the gospel is, and now we're going to look at why share the gospel. Remember, sharing the gospel is the theme of the weekend. What is it? And now, why share it? Okay, and so first we'll look, again, you can see your outline. First we'll look at some of the theology behind the why, and then we'll look at some of the commands behind the why And then lastly, we'll look at some of the really uh, convicting reasons, always convicting to myself, of why we so often don't share the gospel with the lost around us. The opening uh, scripture we'll read is the Great Commission, one I'm sure we're all quite familiar with. And I want us to understand that this Great Commission is given to the church. And from different angles, we can either think about the church as organization or as organism. As organization, the church has officers and it has a government. And then as organism, the church is a living body filled with many members. And so the church as organization takes the lead in the Great Commission teaching, discipling, administering the sacraments. Nevertheless, it is a work in which every member of the organism has a share and a part to play. So that I want us to know, and I hope we'll see it later in a few passages that we'll look at. Hear now the Word of God from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. All right, so as we start our theology section, some fuel for our why, I want us to just briefly look at, and we'll essentially assume the truth of it. This is not a lecture proving uh, the five points of Calvinism to you, but why, contrary to others, why does the tulip fuel our evangelism okay so first with total depravity total depravity paul in ephesians 2 1 makes the same statement uh, that those who are not in christ are dead in their trespasses and sins okay so we see there's a great need (laughs) there is a great need around us We are surrounded by people who are sick, dead, and dying, and in need of the cure that only the gospel of Jesus Christ can give them. 
We're not surrounded by people who are well. We're surrounded by dead people. Okay, And so total depravity teaches us there's a great need. Why should we share the gospel? Surrounded by dead people who need it. Second, and we'll float through these pretty quick. Second, unconditional election. Ephesians 1, 4-6. Teaches that God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself. According to to the pleasure, the good pleasure of His will, to the praise and glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Okay, and so you see that God from all eternity has determined to save some of these dead people. Okay? So though we are surrounded by a mass of dead people, spiritually speaking, in their sins... Yet we know for a fact that God has determined from before the foundations of the world to save some of them. And that should stir us up that some of these dead people will live because God has determined that they will be made alive in Christ. So why should we share the gospel? Because God has determined to save Some of the dead people, you see. Now, limited atonement. Limited atonement. Something we talked about briefly in the first lecture. John 10, 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He doesn't give his life for the goats. Matthew 25 distinguishes between sheep and goats. These are the only two kinds of people there are. He doesn't give his life for the goats. He gives his life for the sheep. He gives his life for his sheep. So we know again that though we are surrounded by dead people, there are some of those dead people for whom Jesus Christ died in time. Okay, God determined that they would be saved from all eternity. And then in time, Jesus Christ actually died for their sins. And they need to be told that. They need to be freely offered the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't don't say Christ died for your sins because you don't know that. But you do say Christ died for sinners. He died for sinners. And the sheep were here. Which brings us to the next point. Okay? So, limited atonement. Why should we share the gospel? Christ on the cross paid their fine and they need to be told that and they need to hear it. But then in the same chapter, John 10, 27, speaking of His sheep for whom He would and did give His life, He says, My sheep hear My voice and I know them and they follow Me. Okay? So though there are people who look like goats and are in a sense goats for a time, yet because God has decreed from all eternity to save them and because Christ laid His life down for them in time, in God's time, when they hear that gospel, the voice of their shepherd, the goats' robes come off and we see that they are a sheep. They are sheep. Goats don't hear the voice. Okay, but those who are sheep, determined sheep, hear the voice of the Savior and He draws them unto Himself, makes them alive, gives them ears to hear. Irresistible grace. So why do we share the gospel? Because His sheep will hear. And we know it. Though there are people who are deaf, there are people who will hear. So we share the gospel. Okay? We tell them to come to Him. And they will hear, and they will know, and they will follow. Okay? And then same chapter. Same chapter. 
John 10, 28 to 30, Christ says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Okay, those He chose, those for whom He died, okay, those who hear His voice, those will endure to the end. They will not be lost. It's impossible. It's an impossibility for one who has truly come to Christ to lose what they have. Okay, and so you see how that can be a great motivator. When we share the gospel with someone, if they truly come to believe, they can't lose that. It would be kind of demotivating if it's like, ah, oh, yes, this person, they believed. If they could actually, in truth, lose it two weeks later, lose that gift that God had given them. Okay, so though we saw they may go through many dips. In life, they can never totally nor finally lose their salvation. Okay? So we see, briefly, what great motivation our theology of salvation gives to us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? This duty would be less motivating. Would be less motivating if everyone around us was a good person. If there was no need of this gospel, this duty would be less motivating if we did not know for a fact that God had determined to save some. If we didn't know that He had not determined to save any at all, it would be less motivating. It would be less motivating if Christ merely died for the possibility to save some. But we know that He died to save and that He accomplished that. You see, and it'd be less motivating if we knew not whether any would actually respond to the call of Christ. If there's only just dead people to hear, but we know that some will hear his voice. And it would be less motivating again if everyone who accepted Christ truly could turn around and lose that salvation. Okay, so though many think it otherwise, it's a true Reformed theology of salvation which provides true fuel for evangelization. You see, the tulip, it should set our hearts ablaze with the good news of Jesus Christ and stir us up to want to go and tell the sheep want to go and find those you never know when you knock on a door you go out that may be a sheep and i may have the wonderful privilege of being the one through whom they hear christ's voice you see and you know you know that it could be okay so that's the tulip motivation the next aspect of our theology that fuels our why for sharing the gospel is our theology of the free offer. The genuine, true, real, free offer of the gospel indiscriminately to all. In our RP testimony, chapter 10, paragraph 3, we testify that we reject the teaching that the gospel offer of salvation is freely and truly offered only to the elect. We don't believe it's freely and truly offered only to the elect, but to all who hear it. R.P. Testimony 14.9. We testify that God's offer of salvation is genuine regardless of man's response. It doesn't matter how man responds. God's offer of salvation is genuine. And we may ask, why do we believe that? Why do we have those statements in our testimony? 
It's because the scriptures teach it. It's because the scriptures teach it. Matthew 5, 45. Okay, Matthew 5, 45. In calling us to love even our enemies, Christ points to our Heavenly Father as our example and says that He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. I know that says nothing about the gospel, but what it does is it teaches us a foundational paradigm for understanding God's disposition towards sinners. So while it's the case that in one sense God hates sin and is angry with sinners, yet we see that God also truly and really manifests love towards sinners. Okay, so there's already... We already have, before we even talk about the gospel, this wider teaching that even though angry with sinners, there is this loving disposition indiscriminately shown to all. So it already orients us when we're thinking about the free offer of the gospel up top. Okay? Now, Ezekiel 18, 23, and 32. I assume you, you've, you've heard all these passages, but it's good to have them in our heads again. God says, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Romans 2, 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and Long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And then 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So while it is the case that God has not determined to save every sinner, yet these passages reveal to us that there's a real sense in which God desires the salvation of every sinner. And while it's impossible for our finite minds to fully comprehend how those two things can be put together, They're nevertheless true. And an illustration, I think, gives us an example to help us at least somewhat understand how this can be the case. How God has one will, and yet there's these different aspects to it. The determination and the disposition. Okay, So for example, it absolutely grieves me to have to discipline my children. I don't enjoy a second of it. I wish sincerely that I did not have to do it. Even as I'm doing it, I wish that I did not have to do it. The will and the wish is genuine. And yet at the exact same time, I'm determined to do so. I will to do so. Okay, And so while not a perfect analogy, going from the finite to the Infinite, no analogy will ever be perfect, but at least helps us to see that there's no logical contradiction to say that both things are true. That there is a sense in which God wills the salvation of all, as those passages teach, and yet with that same will, there's a sense in which He does not will. He has not determined to save every sinner. So there's no contradiction even though it is above us to comprehend, you see. And we see then that this disposition of God towards sinners actually leads to concrete offer of the gospel to every sinner. Isaiah 55, 1. Oh, everyone. Okay, he doesn't say some or with everyone who thirsts come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Free, free offer to every one. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus says, come to me, 
some of you know. Come to me, all, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Revelation twenty two, seventeen, The Spirit and the Bride. Okay, so the Spirit-filled Bride of Christ, the church filled by the Spirit, says to all, freely to all, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Freely. Free offer. To every one. So the God, so though God has only determined to save one or some, which as we saw in and of itself is a motivation to evangelism. Okay? The fact that he actually has determined to save some. And yet it's also the case that because he freely offers the gospel to some, that is a genuine, true, real, free offer, that that also should simultaneously motivate us. Because we're not going out as some sort of scam salesman trying to offer to people something they're not really offered. No. When you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone, there is a genuine reaching down of God in that offer to save that sinner, as our testimony says, regardless of their response. Free offer of the gospel. Okay? So our tulip fuels our why. The free offer fuels our why. And then next, the optimistic vision of the spread of the gospel should fuel our why. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about your eschatology, whether uh, you're amillennial or postmillennial. That, that doesn't matter. Either way, you should have an optimistic view of the spread of the gospel in this age because the Scriptures have an optimistic view of the spread of the gospel in this age. Okay, The Psalms which we sing often proclaim, Psalm 22, 27, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. 67, 7, God shall bless and all the ends of the earth shall fear Him. 72.17 All nations shall call Him blessed. 86.9 All nations whom You have made shall come and worship before You, O Lord, and shall glorify Your name. Isaiah 2.2 Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, that's these days, Not in the consummation, but in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Malachi 1.11 For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles in every place. Incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. My name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Romans chapter 11 foretells a glorious future conversion of the nation of the Jews. Matthew 16, 18 says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the march of Not of our power, not of our political might, of the gospel. In the book of Acts, in the book of Revelation, teach an optimistic view of the spread of the gospel even in spite of and in the midst of persecution and suffering. The elect will be called. The nations will flow. Okay? So this truth... And these promises that we've just heard from God's Word should stir us up. Should stir us up to take the Gospel to the lost in the nations. They should fuel our why. Okay? And the last aspect of our theological fuel for the why we should share the Gospel the biblical doctrines of heaven and hell. 
biblical doctrines of heaven and hell. First, the Bible's doctrine of hell should fuel our why. Ted Donnelly wrote a book called Heaven and Hell. I don't know if you've ever read that book. If not, you should. Because in there, and I still remember reading this book for the first time and this things I'm about to share with you, he presents a striking, vivid, and convicting biblical picture of hell. Okay? First, Donnelly says, it's a place of absolute poverty. It's a place of absolute poverty. Matthew 8, 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? In hell, every ray of light will be removed. A buddy of mine I went to seminary with, his name's Josh Smith, he talked about this time he went caving, and when they get to the middle of this cave, they shut out all the lights. But they couldn't do so for more than a short amount of time, apparently, said the guide, because if they had left their lights out for too long, they could have caused permanent eye damage, because the eyes would have been straining so hard for a single ray of light, and yet there was none to be found. That's utter darkness. That is hell. That's the poverty of utter darkness. Donnelly says absolute poverty also implies the removal of every drop of joy. The removal of of every drop of dignity and value, the removal of every drop of goodness and kindness, says Donnelly, it is every good taken away and everything bad let loose. Hell is absolute poverty. Second, hell is agonizing pain. Matthew 18.8 It is better for you to enter into life maimed or lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. Okay, and we need to remember what hell is, that lake of fire, what it actually is. It happens after the general resurrection. After unbelievers' souls are reunited to their bodies, they will then be cast, body and soul, into the lake of fire, just as believers will enter body and soul into the new heavens and the new earth. And so Donnelly paints this picture. And he said, and most of us have done it, right? Picture your hand, you're touching a hot pan or a hot oven and we know that searing pain on our hand we can't wait to draw it away and then it burns and it hurts and Donnelly says imagine that over a sinner's entire body with no hope of ever removing it's as if the entire body is stuck to a hot pan and that's merely the bodily pain it doesn't even get at the immense pain of the soul and the anger that will be caused. Donnelly says that hell and the agonizing pain is the terrible counterpart to the burning bush. That bush that burned and yet was never consumed. Hell is agonizing pain. Third, hell is a place of God's angry presence. Angry presence, speaking of the unbeliever, Revelation 14.10 states that he shall be, that is the unbeliever, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And in the presence of the Lamb. Okay? So though hell is everlasting, 
separation from God in one sense, it is not an escape from His presence. The separation of hell, to say it another way, is relational, not geographical. Okay, and we know what this is like. Imagine you're in a car from Kansas to Colorado and you get in an argument with somebody. There's relational separation. And yet you're stuck. You're stuck in the awkwardness until you reconcile. So there is relational separation between you and a brother or sister while you're right next to each other. While there is no geographical separation, you see. So God's angry presence will be continuously and constantly manifested toward unbelievers in hell. Hell is God's angry presence. And then fourth and lastly, hell is an appalling prospect. An appalling prospect. Preeminently, or sorry, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, okay, speaking of unbelievers. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Everlasting destruction. Okay? So hell is an appalling prospect preeminently because those three terrible aspects we just mentioned will have no end. The utter darkness, the absolute poverty, the agonizing pain, the angry presence will never end. After a trillion years, those there will be no closer to getting out than they were when they began. It's an appalling prospect. It's an appalling prospect. The darkness, the poverty, the pain, the wrath, and the destruction will never end. And that should fuel. That should fuel our why. Because why would we ever want anyone to go to such a place. The very thought of hell should so disturb us and show, so move us that we should share the gospel with those around us. Think about it. If we saw a blind man walking toward a cliff, would we not say something? Would we not say something? And yet is it not the case that we're surrounded by a blind multitude walking towards something incomprehensibly worse than falling off a cliff? And what of heaven? What of heaven? Well, first, heaven is a place of no sin. Heaven is a place of no sin. Revelation 21, 27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. Heaven is a place of no sin. And if you don't hate your sin, that won't sound attractive to you. But if you hate your sin, you'll long for the place of no sin. Because not only will our guilt, will the guilt of sin be removed, Not only will the power of sin be broken, those happen in this life, but the presence of sin will be removed forevermore. Okay, Heaven is a place of no sin. It's a place of grace perfected. It's a place of grace perfected. 1 Corinthians 15.53 Paul states that to enter heaven, this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. And then in 1549, just before that, Paul said, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. We must and we will be fully conformed to the image of Jesus Christ when we enter into heaven in that, in body and soul. We will be glorified in body and soul. So you say, Or so you see, contrary to the agonizing pain of hell, in glory, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, 
Only grace perfected and abounding. The fruit of the Spirit, you see, will perfectly fill the garden of our souls. Not a sinful weed. Not a single sinful weed to be found. So no sin. Grace perfected. And then knowledge perfected. Heaven will be a place where our knowledge of our God is perfected. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. We'll know our God perfectly as to fact. We won't have a single wrong thought about Him. I heard a professor once say, right, when you get a spouse... If you have a spouse, some of you in here. Like if you love her or him, you should want to speak rightly about them. You don't want to say that she or he has blue eyes when they have green eyes. Or that they're five foot nine when they're actually five foot four. You want to speak rightly about them because you love them. And if you love Jesus Christ, you should long to speak only rightly about Him, and in heaven, in glory, on the new heavens and earth, you will. Knowledge perfected is a defining point of heaven. But we'll also know Him perfectly, not only as to fact, but as to experience. We will know Him with a level of intimacy and warmth and devotion that we can't truly grasp in this life while we still grasp and wrestle with our sin. And then, fourth and lastly, as to heaven. It's a place where we will look upon the face, we'll have a vision of the glory of our triune God in the face of Jesus Christ. We will look upon Him face to face. 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to to face. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like you will set your eyes upon the one who saved you. And you'll adore the beauty of his face in glory forever in his gracious presence. Not his wrathful presence, in his gracious presence forever. Okay, these should fuel our why. If that vision of heaven doesn't warm and excite your soul, beloved, the problem's with you. The problem is with you. It should fuel our why. It should fuel our love for God and why we share the gospel. Question. I'm not just not throwing it out. I'm going to answer it, but or it's rhetorical. Let's think about this. If you had an opportunity somehow of giving to a complete stranger the news, right, that they were being offered a two-week, all-expenses-paid vacation at some tropical paradise, would that not excite you and motivate you to go tell them that news? Or we've seen those videos, somebody has a million-dollar check and they just get to go give it to somebody at some house. Like if somebody said, hey, you get to do that, <laughs> you'd be excited. You wouldn't be nervous about going to that person's house. You would just be amped up. Look what I got for you. Look what I got. If all they had to do was say yes to receive that offer, and yet how much more of the free offer of heaven excite and motivate us to share the gospel with others, even with complete strangers? I know that's the ideal. We're weak and we're sinners and we struggle. But the ideal should be set before us. It should. It should motivate us to go and share the gospel with others. So that's our motivating theology. Okay, the motivation of the tulip, the motivation of the free offer, the motivation of the optimistic view in the scriptures of the spread of the gospel, and the motivation of the everlasting realities of heaven and hell. Okay? Now I want us to look briefly at some passages which teach our duty, our duty to share the gospel. Okay? 
Reformed Presbyterian Testimony, chapter 10, paragraph 6, states, Evangelism is the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord as He is offered in the Gospel. Christ laid the responsibility upon the whole church to make this proclamation. The task is not restricted to ordained officers. Each member is to take his share of the responsibility according to the gifts God has given him. Okay? So we state that Christ has given a share of the responsibility of the Great Commission to every member of the organism. Okay? And that's another reason why, that's more fuel for why we ought to share the gospel. Why ought we share the gospel? Because Christ has called us to do it. Our Lord has called us to do it. And so we ought to do it. Okay? Some, some passages which support this view. Okay? Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And even though it's the case that in Matthew 5, certainly the focus and the emphasis is on your good works as being those lights, that light which glorifies your Father in heaven, nevertheless, it's the case that some other passages in the Scriptures teach us that the fact that we are light and our duty to shine as light involves the sharing of the light of the gospel. Okay, Philippians 2, 15 through 16 speaks of believers as those who shine as lights in the world. And then it says, holding fast the word of life. The phrase there, holding fast, can just as easily mean holding forth. I'd submit to you that in context, There, that I-N-G word, that holding, is there telling us how we are to shine as lights. You shine as lights, how? By, by holding forth the word of life that is the gospel. Ephesians 5, 8 and 11. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And that word, therefore, expose, speaks to exposing by way of words, by reproof or some other use of words. You're to expose darkness. You do that preeminently when you share the light of the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ in a dark world world. Ephesians 4.12, Paul says that God gave officers to the church. Okay, Some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay, So you, every member, the saints, have a ministry unto the edifying of the body of Christ. And certainly that means that we ought to be about the business of ministering to one another, leading unto the sanctification, the growth and holiness of the body of Christ. But that word edify just simply means build up. And so you too have a part in this ministry of building up the church, not only in holiness but in number of members, of bringing in more members to the body of Christ, helping the body not only to grow up unto holiness, but to grow out in number, you see. And then lastly, we see all of this playing out in Acts chapter 8 amongst ordinary church members. Acts 8, 1. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all, okay, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So so they're not the apostles, 
But they all scattered. Okay, and then Acts 8, 4, what did they go about doing? Those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the gospel. Okay, now we believe it's the case that not every member, there's no blurring of the distinction here between officers and members. We believe that only the officers are authoritatively set apart to proclaim with authority the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet the word, interestingly, that's used there in Acts 8.4 in the Greek is not the common word that's used for that kind of authoritative preaching. It's simply the verbal form of the word for gospel. And so literally you could say they went about gospeling. They simply went about sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the lost around them. Okay, ordinary church members in the book of Acts taking part in their share of the responsibility of the Great Commission. Okay, and the question I want us to end with now is why so often don't we do likewise? And I'm included in this. Why so often don't we do likewise? Okay? And the answer is most often found in two related reasons. The fear of man and the lack of love. And that's really what it comes down to. The fear of man and the lack of love. I'll have you ask in your discussion groups if you can think of any others, and you may well. But most of them will probably be attached to fear of man and lack of love. Okay? We fear man in two ways. First, we're afraid. We're afraid of man. We're afraid what men might do to us. In our weakness, we fear persecution. We fear reproach. We fear cancellation. We fear what man can and might do to us. And so we don't share the gospel with men, women, and children. Okay? So we're afraid of men. And then second, we revere Men. We idolize men. We care more about what men think about us than what God thinks about us. We care more about our earthly reputation before men than we care about our reputation before the Lord. We're ashamed of the gospel. We're ashamed of it. And we care too much what others will think of us if we share the gospel with them. And so often, therefore, we don't. We don't. Then second, second, we all too often lack love for God and love for the lost. Love for God and love for the lost. John fourteen fifteen, Christ says, If you love me, keep my commandments. I hope we've seen he commands us to share the gospel. He says if we love him, we'll do it. If we love him, we'll do it. Hard words, but true words. Okay? Is it not the case that so often we don't share the gospel because we don't love him as we ought? Surely it is the case more than we'd like to admit. Surely it is the case more than we'd like to admit. But we also lack love for the loss. We've seen this morning that a multitude around us are heading for a most terrible place. And yet we know again that if we saw a blind person walk off a cliff without us saying anything, or if we walked by our neighbor on the front porch while we saw smoke arising from his house, and we just turned our head and kept going, would we not say that that is unloving? (laughs) That we did not love that neighbor or that blind man. And so how could it be otherwise when we don't speak up It doesn't mean that everywhere is the right time to share the gospel. If 
you have work you must do, or there's quiet time, you're taking an exam in a classroom, you're not to just stand up on your chair and start preaching. But so often we let those extraordinary qualifications fuel our flesh to just driving by so many people and not looking for opportunities to share the gospel with them. Okay? So if we're honest with ourselves, and I still remember, I remember, okay, when I was taking the evangelism class at seminary, like scouring the internet, reading, like, give me some reason that makes me feel good about myself for why I don't share the gospel. And all I heard people saying, pastors and others, and they're the two we've given. And that hurts. We don't share the gospel because we fear man and we lack love. Okay, And we need to own up to that that we may repent of it. That we may repent of it. That we may not fear man. And that we may love the Lord and the lost how He calls us to. And we need to pray. We need to pray often that God would fill us with His love because His love is the only hope and the only cure for the fear of man and the lack of loving Him. 1 John 4.18 It says perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love from a perfect Father in heaven is the only affection which can expel fear of man and lack of love. It's the only one. It's our only hope. That He would fill us with His love. And we need to cry out for it. And yet at the same time, again, we're not to just sit on the couch and wait until we just start loving people. We go and we love. And we simultaneously pray that He would fill us with His love. Okay, last thing. We're about done. Last thing that I'll leave you with to fuel your why for sharing the Gospel is an encouragement to meditate upon your own salvation. That God in Christ saved you. If indeed He really has. You, a chief sinner. He saved. He came and He died. That painful and shameful death on the cross. Nails driven into his wrists and into his feet, he suffocated. And he did it because he loved you. And you should meditate on his patience with you. His love for you manifested in the gospel until until your heart is warmed to the point at which you cannot keep your mouth shut any longer. And you must. You must share the gospel. Okay, so we've seen this morning what the gospel is. We've just seen why we should share the gospel. And then when we come back this evening, we'll look at a method as to how to share the gospel. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do, uh, me preeminently, Lord, you know my heart. Lord, we do confess We do confess that we fear man. That we're weak. That we care more about what men think about us than what you do. We confess that we don't love you how we ought. That we don't love the lost how we ought, Lord. And yet we thank you that you have forgiven our sins, that you are patient with us. And yet, O God, that doesn't, that doesn't comfort us unless it stirs us up at the same time, Lord, to be pleasing in Your sight. To respond to the grace of the Gospel by sharing that with others. Lord, and so may these truths that we've looked at, these commands that we've looked at now and may the time during our discussion, Lord, be a means by which You would warm our own hearts to such a temperature, such a degree, Lord, that we would be compelled out of love for You and love for the lost to share the Gospel with those around us, Lord, as we have genuine 
opportunity to do so. Give us boldness. Give us grace and love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.